we're going to jump into the message today because things are different and because we've got the kids in here with us, it's going to be abbreviated. So I'm going to move through this message quickly. Somebody's excited about that right there. But we're in a series called Crossing Over. This is part four. I want to bring you up to speed real quick. Week one, we talked about God's people got rescued out of Egypt and they crossed over the Red Sea into what was known as the wilderness. It was supposed to be an 11-day journey from Egypt to the promised land. But they missed it. They complained. They grumbled. They were negative. And God said, you're not going to cross over the Jordan River into the promised land. You're going to wander around for 40 years until an entire generation died off. We said week one, it's all about quit camping, start crossing. You've got to embrace the pain, count the cost, cross over the threshold, which in their situation was the Jordan River. In our situation, there's a threshold God wants you to cross over. He's calling you to embrace it. He's calling you to step into, and it's going to require some sacrifice. Week two, we talked about seize the season. Seize the season. The Moses generation missed out on the promises God had for them. But the Joshua generation took hold because they seized the season. They understood God was calling them into the promised land. He had something for them, and they took hold of it. God said, if you will obey, then I will give you the promised land. Moses missed out. They said, we don't want to miss out. We want to seize the season. We've got to seize the season. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, seize the season. Seize the season. That's fun to say. Week three. Last week, we talked about being positioned to proceed, positioned to proceed, that as soon as they crossed over the river, God said, all right, I want you to make a flint knife, and I want you to circumcise all the men. Hello. And uh, he said, there's some things I got to cut away in order for you to step into the land I'm calling you to. Now, God is not calling us to do that today. How many of you are grateful for the time in which we live today? But the Bible says in Hebrews that he's not looking for an external circumcision. It's about an inward circumcision, a circumcision of the heart, if you will. I just said circumcision a lot. Some of you are very uncomfortable right now. Welcome to church. Today, week four, I've entitled this message. If you're taking notes, we didn't hand you anything to take notes with, so maybe you've got a phone, an app, something already in your Bible or your purse. I encourage you to take notes. Manna is off the menu. Manna is off the menu. Are you expecting for God to speak to you today? Are you in anticipation that you're not just to hear from a guy, a pastor, you're here to hear from heaven, the living God who wants to connect with you this morning? I encourage you to lift your expectations if you're not. Let's pray before we dive in. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you're here, that your word is alive. God, we thank you that you are doing something in our midst, and we are witnessing the beginning of a new season of promise, of breakthrough, of blessing. We are stepping into the promised land you have for us. And Lord, I thank you that this is a group of people who have ears to hear you and a heart to obey. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Fasten your seatbelts, buckle up. I want to just bring you up to speed. Joshua chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, we looked at last week. At the time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Not that they were already circumcised and he wanted them to circumcise themselves a second time. It was an entirely new group of people, so that's why he said again. And he said, so Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. That's a fun thing to say. Literally, what this is saying is that God asked these guys to do something extremely painful, and they did it. They obeyed. This was the condition of their hearts. They were willing to do anything so that they could step into what God had for them. We're going to read uh, in verse 8, skipping down a few verses. This will show up on the screen. After the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. I love that. This is what Darren alluded to. I believe the Holy Spirit put that on his heart because I wrote down, after the Lord cut some things away, he allows you time to heal. God's going to ask you to cut some things out of your life to do a circumcision of your heart so that you can be positioned to proceed so that you can move forward into the next level he has for you. And he doesn't do that without allowing you time to heal, allowing you time to mend. He wants to improve, to cut away. He wants to be the ultimate surgeon, but he understands that some things are painful. Some of you are here today, and it's All-Star October, and we didn't set up any environments, and you're like, oh, Boy, what did I get myself into? What is going on? I was looking for a break from my kids. <laughs> and some of you are feeling the pressure. And that's good. That's the intention. <laughs> 
You're feeling like, man, I got to help out around here. I got to join a team. It's time to cross over into being a consumer and becoming a contributor. But I need to pause and say, if you are burnt out, as Darren said, if you are coming out of a season where God has been cutting some things away and you need a place to rest and you need a place to heal, this is the place for you. I didn't know that I said that all those years ago when Darren was here, but amen. That was good. That was good. Right there. (laughs) We believe faith is a verb. It's spelled R-I-S-K. Sometimes, though, faith is spelled W-A-I-T. Sometimes God wants you to wait on him to rest so that you can H-E-A-L. That's enough hooked on phonics. I think you guys get it. But for everybody else... If you're not burnt out, if you're not in a season where you need rest, that you need healing, God is calling you to cross over and to step up. He's calling you to join a team, to use your gifts for him. You are not just here on planet Earth for you. God designed you to do good works. He's given you ability. He's given you health so that you can serve him, so that you can bring him honor and glory with your life. Those who get this are the ones that are truly living. Jesus said, you want to find your life? Lose it. Lose it for my sake in the gospel. Jesus' words. Those who discover this understand this verse, Psalm 8410. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. It's better to serve in God's house, setting up chairs or pipe and drape or serving in the kids' ministry or making coffee. It's better to do anything and everything it takes to honor God, to build his house, to be passionate about what he is passionate about than to be outside the church and to be living in the world, wandering around with a sense of lostness and purposelessness and wandering. That's a good place to say amen. We're going to keep reading in verse 9 of Joshua 5. It says, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. I looked up the word reproach. It literally means an expression of rebuke or disapproval, a cause or occasion of blame, discredit, or disgrace. The people crossed over the Jordan River. God said, I want you to to circumcise. I want you to cut some things away. And then, then God says, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. I've taken away the disgrace of your past. He wants us to cut things away so that we are not who we used to be, so we're not living in the past we used to live in. He wants to roll away the, the disgrace, the discredit, the blame, and step into the better things of God. It's not always easy. In fact, it can be painful. Any of you who have been through this know that to be true. But it's so much better. It's so worth it. It's what God has for each and every one of us. Verse 10, as we keep reading, on the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Verse 11, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted Grain. Now, let me explain manna. For those of you who grew up in church, you're probably familiar. If you're not, manna was literally a miracle. The, the Israelites, God's people, were wandering around in this wilderness, and it's not a place of abundance. It's not a place of resource and blessing. So God provided for them literally sending down substance from heaven. It was a doughy-like substance that would rain, and they would collect it. They would pick it up off the ground, and it would be all the nutrition and the substance they would need to be healthy and survive. It was miraculous, and God did this over 300 times a year for 40 years. It's amazing. In fact, he did it, and he said, just collect enough for today, because if you try to store it up, it's going to get all wormy and, and nasty anyways, and they did that, and they learned that he was right, except for the sixth day. He said, take up a double portion of it so that you can rest on the Sabbath. It was a miracle. But can I tell somebody, there's a better way. (laughs) Manna is a miracle, but it gets old. Even the best things, if you had it every single day, how many of you know you would get sick and tired of that? I'm a steak guy. Any steak guys in here? Like, I like uh, New York, or give me a filet mignon in Jesus' name, and cook that thing medium rare. I don't understand you people who go, well done. It's just ruining it. I'm sorry. We love you. We have a time of prayer for you afterwards. God made meat, and he said, cook it medium rare. It's in the Bible. But 
if I had steak every single day, I think I would get sick of it. Some of you are like, uh-uh, I'd like to try that. I'm pretty sure if we had something every day and manna wasn't steak, y'all, can you imagine manna, this doughy, like, gooey substance every single day for 40 years? I just, I, I thank God that he provides for us miraculously when we need him, that he'll give us just enough for today when we're wandering in the wilderness. But there is a better way. There's a better land. There is a life that God wants you to live that you're not dependent upon manna from heaven every day, that you've got more than you know what to do with. So you can have steak cooked medium rare one day and you can mix it up and do some fettuccine the next day. Come on, somebody. You guys are getting hungry. We're almost done. (laughs) God said we're going to move you into a land and it says the day after that they had the produce of the land. The produce of the land. You see, manna represents a mindset. You need manna when you're in the wilderness. You need just enough for now, just enough for today so that you can get by. Some of you are living your life this way. Don't raise your hands. Some of you have this mentality. I just need enough for me. I just need enough for my family. I just need enough to get by today. And Jesus did pray, give us this day our daily bread. But he also said, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Can I tell you that in God's kingdom, they ain't eating manna every single day. They don't have just enough for today. God is the God of the overflow, of the much, of the abundance. God wants to give us so much. He wants to bless you so much that you will be a blessing to those around you. He wants to fill up your cup so full that it's overflowing onto the other people around you. He wants God's people to be blessed. It's not just about enough for you, enough for today. I'm not just talking about money. I'm not talking about resource. I'm talking about emotional equity. I'm talking about vision for your future. I'm talking about some joy. I'm talking about peace and relational strength and, of course, resources as well. And and some of us in here, we're just, we're always redlining. We're always just almost running out. We're always just barely making it. Can I tell you that there is a better life to be lived, that God wants you to live in the promised land where there is an abundance? If manna is a negative mindset, produce, on the other hand, represents abundance. There's a difference between abundance and barely enough. Abundance versus barely enough. Barely barely enough, you're looking for a handout. You're praying for that miracle. Lord God, will you just please provide? I don't know how I'm going to make it. And listen, we serve a God who's so good that he does. He will come through in the 11th hour. He will not leave you or forsake you. He will bring you exactly what you need. But can we move from a manna mindset into an abundance mentality? Wouldn't you prefer to live in a place where you have more than you know what to do with? Guess what? You start asking the question, man, what do I do with all this? Who can I share it with? Who else can I help? I believe that the people of God, as true in this day, the Israelites, and now we are grafted into the people of God, should be the most blessed people on the earth, the most influential people on the earth. God wants you to step into a place where you're experiencing deeper levels of him. You understand his grace on a whole new level. You understand his, his forgiveness and his righteousness, and you're walking in communion and relationship with him. And by the way, he's supplying for you more than enough. There's a lot of promises in the Bible about God providing just in the nick of time. And I thank God for that. But did you know there's even more promises about God blessing the fruit of your labor, about you being rich and successful and increasing as a product of your hard work. Verse 12 says, the manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. God said, hey, manna's off the menu. The way you used to live, the way you used to think, that's in the past. That's part of the wilderness. You've crossed over into the promised land, and now no longer are you going to eat the substance from heaven. You're stepping into the produce of the land. And for that entire year, it was like God was training them. This is the blessing. This is the fruit. This is the produce of the land. You have to go from picking to planting, is how I put it. Picking, they would pick up the manna off the ground every single day. Pick it up, pick it up, gather it up, and just kind of soup it up. Pick it up, pick it up. And God says, I'm bringing you into a land of blessing. But here's the thing about the land of blessing. God said it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. How many of you guys like milk? Any milk fans in here? How about honey? 
I'm one of those weird people that put honey in my coffee. I know. It sounds strange. It sounded really strange to me until I tried it. I'm like, oh, that's actually really good. And I don't like all the chemicals of this. Anyway, no judgment. But you should try it. Honey is delicious. Milk is good. But it doesn't just grow out of the ground, does it? It actually requires some work. I don't know if any of you own a cow. If you do, that's awesome. We're close to Vista. There's some spots. But you got to feed a cow. You got to water a cow. You got to take care of a cow. Sometimes the cow gets pregnant. Sometimes a cow gets sick. And then guess what? You got to milk a cow. Has anybody milked a cow in here? This will be fun. A few of you. Yeah, that's awesome. Would you come up on? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We don't want to see that. Uh, (laughs) You got to work to get that milk. Even if it's a goat. (laughs) You got to work. How about honey? You got to Go into the hive. When I was a kid growing up, my dad had beehives, and he put on a space suit to go get the honey out of the hive. And he pulls out this grid, and, and it's full of honeycomb. And even still, you've got to scrape away, and you've got to take the, the chunks out of it, and you've got to bottle. I mean, there's some work involved. I think you guys are getting the point. God has called us into a land of plenty, into a land of blessing, into a land of abundance. He wants us to get away from a manna mentality. But how many of you know there's some work involved to enjoy the blessing? Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. In other words, if you're always waiting for the perfect time, you're never going to start planting. You got to start planting today. You got to start planting. In order to enjoy the harvest and the blessing of the promised land, you got to start planting today. Nobody likes planting, but we all like reaping a harvest, don't we? But God says, if you want to enjoy the blessing, you got to plant. you got to move from picking to planting. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. We could say, well, one day I will. Well, I'm just too busy. Well, I can't plant because it's a heart issue. Everything flows from the heart. This whole all-star October thing, this whole message, this whole series is about your heart, it's about getting you to understand where you are is not yet where God wants you to be. He's got more for you. He's got more for us as a church. He's calling us into bigger things. He's calling you into deeper waters. It's going to require some pain. It's going to require some work and some sacrifice, but it's good. It's blessed. It's abundant, and you've got to start planting today. Deuteronomy 8 describes when God is first telling his people about this promised land. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, it says, Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. All right, pause right there. He said you're going to live and increase and enter and possess. Live, increase, enter, possess. In other words, living is like surviving. Okay, we're all doing that. But he doesn't want you to survive. He wants you to increase. He wants you to thrive. It's about living, which is surviving. It's about increasing, which is thriving. He said, I want you to enter, which is just walking into. God's calling you into it. And then I want you to possess, which is inhabiting or literally taking ownership of. I put it like this. There's a process to your promise. There's a process to your promise. Oh, we love the God who just shows up and does the thing and it's miraculous and sometimes he does, but most of the time he wants you to work the process. God puts principles in his word. He's telling us clearly in this text, there's a process to your promise. You've got to plant, you've got to sow, you've got to work, and then you will reap. Man, I'm excited because the season we're in as a church is unlike any other season we've been in before. God has shown us clearly he's calling us to cross over. He's calling us to step into a promised land. We're starting for the first time at the end of this year, December 3rd, Heart for the House, which is our building campaign. We're saying, let's go for it. God said we can have the land. We're believing for supernatural and miraculous things. We want to take ground in North County for the glory of God. But how many of you know there's a process? It ain't just going to happen. And it's definitely not just going to happen on the shoulders of a few. It's not about equal giving, as I've said. It's about equal sacrifice. If you haven't started building towards your promised land, here's the good news. You can start right now. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, right now. You got to say it with some, with some attitude. Right now. You can start today. It's not too late. 
I doubt you've been wandering for 40 years, but even if you have, God says you can start today. Maybe you've been wandering for 80 years. God ain't done with you yet. If you got a pulse, you got a purpose. God says there's more for you. You ain't done yet. Come on, baby. You ain't done yet. That's some good news right now. You can choose to love God today, serve God today, obey God today. And I put it like this. Your level of blessings are in direct proportion to your level of obedience. You want to be blessed? It's simple. Obey. (laughs) God says, if you will obey, then I will give you the promised land. If you will serve me, love me, honor me, then I will provide for you abundance, blessings, milk, honey, all the rest. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 7, he describes this in detail. For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land. Somebody say good land. It's good. He's bringing you to a good land. A land with brooks, streams, deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees. Fig trees. It's not a cookie. It's a fig newton. Pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. There it is. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where there are rocks and iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Notice he said there's rocks and there's iron and copper that you can dig out of the hills. There's work involved. Hey, how many of you are grateful there's work involved? He doesn't just say, man, just I'm going to give you the mansion on the hill and all the servants and all the staff to keep it. He said, no, 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 no. I'm going to give you the ability, the skills, the talents, the resources to go out and pull that iron out of the hills. There's some value in work. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Basically, God's saying, I'm going to bless you. Build the biggest house you want. Get a 90-inch TV for all I care. I'm going to bless you, but just don't forget me. Don't forget that I'm the one who did this for you. Verse 17 says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Did you know that covenant applies to you and me? The Bible says we are grafted into the family of God. For those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, you may not have been born a Jew or an Israelite, but you are part of the Jewish heritage and therefore a part of the covenant and the promises of God if you will obey. (laughs) It's pretty simple, isn't it? But it's so hard. (laughs) I love how the New Living Translation puts it. Verse 17, he did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. It's okay to be successful. It's godly to be promotable. It's okay to be blessed. But the Bible says, God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to others and so that we honor him with it, that we don't forget that he's the one who gave us the ability. How many of you know that if you live in North County, San Diego, you are blessed? Some of you are like, man, I don't know. You don't understand my situation. I've been just I'm living paycheck to paycheck. God wants to move you out of that manna season and into the season of abundance. And I I, I know he can. I know he will. I've seen him do it for me. I've seen him do it for so many other people. If you start planting today, you start obeying today, he moves you into that season over a process. And the fact that we live within 15 minutes of the beach, we are blessed. (laughs) The fact that we live in this moderate climate, did you know that already? I was watching uh, football Thursday night. No, was it? Yeah. Where Where was football this week? You can tell I'm a huge football fan. Where was it? Green Bay? The point is, it's cold out there, (laughs) y'all. We got it good. I showed up to church today with a jacket. I had to take it off. There's no need. Man, we're blessed. We have the most moderate climate in the entire country. We're so blessed. I get excited. I get to put my slippers on in the morning. It's like, oh, we're blessed. And forget about the fact that we drove here in a climate-controlled vehicle, that we had more than one outfit to choose from our closet, that we have plenty of food in our fridge and in our pantry, that we have not just enough for today. We have options. Like, you could go to Chili's or Applebee's today. (laughs) 
You could go to Papa John's. You, you can't go to Chick-fil-A. They're closed on Sundays. That's a, that's a bummer. But we are blessed. Some of us more blessed than others, of course. But man, you look at the rest of the world, and we are so blessed. And God says, don't forget me. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill his covenant. Manna is a miracle, but it gets old pretty quick. Some of you have been living on manna your whole life. Abundance is yours for the taking. Blessings are yours for the taking. When a group of people get this concept in our brains, and we do this together, giants start to fall in our city. The Jerichos that have been the strongholds of our community, the weapons and the the kingdoms placed by the enemy begin to fall when the people of God start to understand that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm going to count the cost. I'm going to keep on pushing, keep on planting, keep on serving, keep on giving. And as I do, those giants are coming down and the name of Jesus Christ is going to be lifted high in North County, San Diego. We're going forward, y'all. We're crossing over. We're stepping into the promised land, and you can do it too. It's not about a church staff or church leadership. It's about all of us together crossing over. I get a little excited about it. (laughs) The harvest is fun, but planting isn't always. But you cannot have a harvest without planting. We have to start the process. We always like to make the word practical for you today. A few next steps are going to show up on the screen. These are simply, in light of the text today, a next step that maybe God is speaking to you. Number one, you might resonate with this. I'll move away from my manna thinking. The first step starts within us. God wants us to win from within. Once we start winning from within, he changes our heart. He changes our minds so that we're prepared to step into what he has for us. You cannot bypass this step. You cannot take your stinking thinking and enter the promised land and be successful. God wants to transform your mind by the renewing of the word. He wants to renew us. He wants to change us. He wants to refresh us. But we have to partner with him. We have to choose, I want to change. He's not going to force you to. Maybe you'll say, man, I need to move away from my man of thinking in whatever way that looks for you. Maybe number two, you say, I will start planting today. Today's the day. You're going to join a team. You're going to honor God. You're going to obey his word. You're going to serve. You're going to start giving towards his house, the bride of Christ. The most noble effort on planet earth, I assure you, it's why I've committed my entire life towards it. Jesus loves his church so much he died for it. Or number three, you might say, I will obey the word of the Lord. Maybe God has a word for you. He's been prompting you. He's been pointing it out to you in scripture. You've heard it. You know God's trying to speak to you. You heard it in another sermon. You heard it from another person. You read it in a book. And he's been trying to get your attention. He's constantly trying to speak to us. The question is, are we open to hear it? Are we going to respond to it? Maybe today you say, man, I'm going to do, I'm finally, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey the word of the Lord. If you will obey, then you will inherit the promised land. And the promised land is better than the manna-filled wilderness, I promise you. Well, as I mentioned, we have an opportunity to put this into practice quite literally. Coming up on December 3rd, we're doing what we call Heart for the House. Heart for the House. And this is an end of the year offering where we are believing for supernatural favor and increase. Not just over this church. You are the church. (laughs) Over your life. As we obey, as we trust God, as we cross over, and we understand that the resources we have are not just for us, they're for bringing him honor, for building his church, then God blesses. Then God brings the abundance. So on December 3rd, we're doing a Heart for the House offering where we're believing for the biggest offering we've ever seen in the five and a half year history of this church plant. And we're going to challenge you. That's why we're giving you lots of notice. We're all doing this together. As I said, it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. Some of you can write a check for $355,000. That number just came to my head. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you. Selah. (laughs) Some of you can write a check for $355. Some of you can write a check for $3. It's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And so we're going to ask you to 
pray about it. Just ask God, would you have me be part of this? If he says no, don't do it. And on December 3rd, we're going to encourage you, we're going to challenge you to bring the the tithe, bring the offering into the house. But there's also a couple other ways you can give. We're going to do for the first time 12 months of a giving pledge, where you might say, over the next 12 months, I want to stretch my faith. I want to actually believe that I can give this amount towards the building campaign. And then for others of you, the third way that you can give is simply returning the tithe to the Lord. It's saying, hey, I'm going to do what the word says. I'm going to obey and bring the first fruits, the first 10% of what God has given me into the house of the Lord. As we do this together, we are going to cross over into the promised land. You are going to cross over. God wants to bless your obedience. God wants to bless your faithfulness. And so that's why I don't apologize in asking us to do this because it's biblical. They did it then. They do it now. And this is how we move forward. And it's going to be amazing as we do. So that's heart for the house. And then, of course, I'll close with this. Is As you've seen, as I've said, hopefully you're almost tired of hearing about it. We're going to do this every Sunday. It's All-Star October. And, man, we want you to join a team. We want you to get, take part uh, of living on mission and on purpose towards building God's house. And so there's going to be some people, like literally the only thing we set up today, it's like you got to have coffee and donuts. We cannot sacrifice. that. Lord, the cross is too heavy. We cannot give up our cross. I mean, sorry, our, our donuts and our coffee. So we have donuts and coffee, and we got clipboards with sign-up sheets, and that's it. Here's my promise to you. Next week is all going back to normal, all right? We're going to have kids station. We're going to have bigs. We're going to have littles. Whoa, we got some excited parents in the house. They're like, dear Lord, will you dismiss this service already? <laughs> We're going to go to lunch afterwards and have some quiet time, and kids are going to take a nap. In Jesus' name, it's going to be awesome. But hey, we want you to be a part of what God is doing here. So join a team, All-Star October. There's going to be people in the back. Speaking of people in the back, we have some prayer warriors in the back today that are there for you. If you need some prayer, if you are going through something, you are not alone. We want to stand with you. We want to believe in faith, the promises of God, and his provision and his protection over your life. So they are making their way towards the back now. Stop by and get some prayer if you need it. Man, we got some prayer warriors in this house, y'all. They will call down heaven on your life. I'm going to pray over us, and then we are dismissed. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you are into new things, that you are into shaking things up sometimes. And God, we just are so grateful to be a part of the movement of your church. Lord, we thank you that you're doing something in our midst that we will look back on and notice that that time, that season, that series of crossing over was a time where I crossed over from who I used to be into who you're calling me to be. That that was the beginning of an increased time of favor and blessing over my life. And I just thank you. Lord, I see it. I see it in the spirit. I see it in my eye, my mind's eye that so many people in here are, are about to step into a season of increased blessing. So many people are about to step into the promised land you have for them, the thing they've been waiting on, the thing they've been believing for for so many years. Lord, I just declare today that these things shall be done in the name of Jesus, and we give you all the honor and all the glory. Amen. Amen. Come on. Can we give God some praise one more time? He is good.